Public dialogue and civic engagement are important. They play a role in improving the health and well-being of Texans across our great state. That's why Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is proud to support Texas Tribune conversations like the one you're about to see. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Brandon Creighton and the Honorable Tom Oliverson. Give them a hand. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time <clears throat> to be here in the interim. It's a pretty busy time, despite the fact that you all are not in session. Uh, I want to go back, though, and talk about when you were in session for the five months plus the 30 odd, a little bit less than 30 days that you were in the special. The standard question to ask is whether the time you spent in Austin was good for your community. Was the work you did beneficial to your constituents? Dr. Oliverson, this is your first time in the legislature and your first time to see this process up close. You think that your community is better or worse for the work of the legislature this session? I appreciate your question, Evan. I, I think that the community is better. Um, I, I had an opportunity last week to go back to one of my Republican clubs where I remember sort of promising campaign promises, here's what I'm going to work on and things right. like that. And I think, you know, a vast majority of them we accomplished, uh, we achieved. What would, name a couple of the things that you promised that you then came back and achieved. So some of the things that we talked about specifically were uh, dealing with the sanctuary cities issue, yep. uh, which we did get that done. You did. Uh, we talked about easing regulations on small businesses, which we did several bills. In fact, my, uh, my good friend and neighbor, Kevin Roberts, had a really good bill that helped repeal regulations, you know, one for one, where if you add a new regulation, you, you got to subtract them away. Right. Yep. Uh, so lots of good things there. Um, lots of pro-life uh, bills were passed, not only during the regular session, <clears throat> but during the special session But a handful during well. the special as well. Yeah, That's so right. I mean, I think we did uh, very, very well. These were all the things that you had talked about when you were running Correct. Got now, there were a couple things that I talked about, one in particular that we, uh, that I talked about that we weren't able to really deliver on, and that was the property tax thing. And right. Well, we'll, that, we'll come to that. I, I think there's a, there's a, uh, there's a two side of the ledger deal here, the stuff that you did and, and the stuff that you didn't. Senator Creighton, we've been at this together before on a stage like this, yeah. and I always ask you to talk about whether you think you accomplished everything you wanted to or should have in a session like this. On balance, good or a bad, good session or bad session? I think we had a good session. You know, it, it's, uh, it's anyone's opinion in this room or across the state whether they want uh, government to accomplish more or less. Less, right. Or if coming out of a legislative session, if we accomplish a absolutely nothing in some people's minds, that's a major victory for the legislature. So right. it just depends on exactly where you want us to be. Of course, be. you're only obligated to do one thing constitutionally, and that's pass a budget and balance, and, and that's something you did. And most people want yeah. to see that no, no matter what. We passed a very uh, conservative budget. It grew uh, well under growth and in inflation at 1.9% uh, for the next biennium, supporting a trillion dollar GDP in, in, uh, in, in this state economy. And, job creation and everything else we want to see happen in Texas as all of our entrepreneurs and risk takers, businesses do what they do on a daily basis. They want government yep. uh, to provide for those that are the most vulnerable, invest in infrastructure and keep the fiscal house in order and then uh, step aside and let everyone else on a daily basis take it from there. And I think we did a good job there as uh, Representative Oliverson mentioned, voter ID and sanctuary cities investing in the border, overhauling CPS for our most vulnerable Texans, our, our kids that need it the most, the balanced budget, uh, investing in higher education, 2.65 billion more in public ed. These things I would consider all victories, but a lot of times the media reports that the legislature really didn't get enough accomplished or that we might have focused on the wrong priorities. And I think uh, Dr. Alverson and I probably would both say we don't have the luxury of focusing on one priority, it's right. many. Well, let me play the role of lamestream media for a second and focus on some of the things that you didn't accomplish. You mentioned that you put money into school finance or public education. You know that there are two ways to look at that. One way is that you invested money into public education. The other is that after the Supreme Court came back and found last summer that the system of funding public education was awful but lawful, mm -hmm. that you all had an opportunity to overhaul the public school finance system but didn't. Help me understand how I should think about public school finance, Senator Creighton, as it relates to that. Well, I, I think we make uh, sometimes small strides and giant steps, and depending on how you look at either, it could be the same language depending on your interpretation. So a school finance commission to really genuinely, for the first time in decades, look at how our schools, our public schools are financed as we continue to work to overhaul property tax reform 
Just consider what we're doing there in that period of time while oil is historically low. So when you're going to over- well, it's been lower than it, it's been lower than it is now, but it's definitely down. It's been lower it's than down. it is now, but for a trend of time over 30 years, normally that bounce is much quicker than it has been. Fair. And so when you look at that bounce being non-existent, and we go into a legislative session to work on a 216 billion dollar budget, and we have expectations up here to just overhaul the school finance system that's been a soap opera for 40 something years. Right in litigation for all that time, it's not as much a quick fix, and there's certainly the dollars are very, very tight, knowing that we came into session a billion low on our Medicaid forecast. Yep. These are heavy, heavy concerns and a big lifts, but that school finance commission is very important. It's a very meaningful, substantive right. fix, and yep. we're gonna work towards the solution. Now you know, uh, Senator Creighton, there are some who would say that the legislature over time has studied school finance a lot and that all this is doing is kicking the can a little bit down the road. What do you say about that? I think that uh, quick band-aid approaches are kicking the can further down the road and that's what we would have found in a low revenue session if yep. we truly wanted to to uh, to solve some of the problems where again the Supreme Court said right. lawful but awful. Uh, historically the legislature has only moved, moved on school finance when we've been forced to out of litigation yet we weren't forced to because it, the equity side of it was upheld. Right. So knowing that we weren't forced to do anything and knowing that revenue was, was in a terrible situation as far as our forecast and yep. meeting the demands of a growing state, I think we made some, some, some big steps that will prove to be very significant and we got really close to changing school finance for the long run but the details always can unravel things, even in the family, if you know what I mean. So. Now, Do Dr. Oliverson, you're the, the new guy here, right? So you've, you're just kind of coming at this from the outside. You also happen to represent a community that has some of the best public schools in the state. Hands down. No Hi doubt. Highest rated, some of the highest rated, some of the best thought of public schools. Is your sense that the system is as broken as some would say, and is your sense that money is the answer to whatever's not working? I think that the, the brokenness in the system comes from the complexity. And I find it very disturbing and troubling that when I ran for office and started, you know, learning some things, you know, we all come in knowing a few things and we learn a lot more, right? Yep. Um, one of the things that I learned is that the school finance formula is, is uh, Byzantine. Yep. It, it's complicated. And, and Senator Creighton rightly so mentioned Band-Aid approaches. We've been adding layers of complexity in order to try to solve various issues of lack of equity or whatever, or we're not spending enough or we're spending too much. We've been adding layers of complexity for so long that it's hard to find somebody in the Capitol who can actually tell you a simple number of how much it costs to educate a child in Texas per year. I mean, that's like the impossible. Well, there are a bunch of numbers of floating five. around. They're not necessarily the same number. You probably Correct, can get five or six different numbers. You, you could, but I hope one of the things that the commission does is, is looks at all of these numbers and looks at all of this complexity and, yeah. and, and comes back with a reasonable and um, uh, explainable simply explainable yep. uh, number that we can actually wrap our, our arms around and, and start building a budget based on how many children do you have in this school and how and therefore how much money yep. you have and um, you didn't bring it up but I'll mention you know the other thing that concerns me is uh, we have a property tax based system for funding a larger and larger portion of public education. Right, the, per the percentage of funding public education I, has I think it gradually it, moved toward property taxpayers. I think right. it makes it harder for us because it exacerbates the inequity. It causes us to add more layers of complexity because the property wealth is not distributed, you know, across the board. Uh, and so we end up with property rich districts and property poor districts. And yep. so. As long as that's the primary system by which we fund, uh, we're going to have a system that's more complicated probably than it needs to be simply because of the, the manner in which the, income, the uh, revenue is collected is very disproportionate depending on where you live. Would you, would you be in favor, Representative Oliverson, of, of the state taking on a greater share of public education as a way to relieve property taxpayers of the burden that they're now increasingly taking on? I would, and I think that, thank you. Appreciate that. I would, and I think that, you know, the folks uh, elect us, representatives and senators, to deal with uh, public school finance. Right. And I think that's our responsibility. And I do think, to a certain extent, in an ever 
increasing percentage, we've kind of abdicated a lot of that responsibility to the local level. And I'd like to see us take it back so that the citizens can, can hold us accountable, hold the legislature accountable for the dollars and cents. And we spend all this time up there debating about how much it costs to educate a child. And yet the reality is, is that I think the latest statistic I read was that less than 40% of that child's uh, uh, funding for that child's education is actually coming from the state. The majority of it's coming at the local level. And, and as we all know, that you know, local elections, local boards, things, you know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of yep. variability. Uh, you mentioned I represent uh, uh, several of the of the best schools districts in the state and you know I'll tell you I, I personally believe that our school districts and Sci Fair are, are reasonably accountable with the dollars that they collect you know they schools are typically overcrowded before a new school is built they're not building a grand new Taj Mahal and leaving it half filled I mean it's, right. a, it's an as need goes on that doesn't mean that every decision that's ever been made out there is one that I've necessarily agreed with but um, I, I just think that that's our job at the state to, to really do that. That is a constitutionally obligated right. thing that we're required well, to well, do. Let me ask Senator Creighton about that. I mean, this is an area, there may not be a lot of bipartisan issues in this legislature, but I think Donna Howard and Tom Oliverson may both believe. Don't, don't say that too loud. Well, but it's true. I mean, you. But she's right, yeah. This is an area of agreement with some Democrats that the state ought to be taking back a larger percentage of the spend on public ed. Do you agree with it? Uh, it depends. My answer is it depends, and, yeah. it, and it usually does. But I, I don't think that the, the state necessarily has to match what the local level is spending on public education. Over the years, we have shifted uh, across a pendulum at the state level of, and I'm, uh, for the last almost 50 years, it's been between the, thir the thir mid-30 percentile and the upper 40th percentile of right. where our, our, our funding is compared to the local level. But as Representative Oliverson mentioned, we can't necessarily keep up with the local spending decisions of local governing entities, nor should we have to. So for instance, our funding for public schools has been doing this for years and years and years. But if local school districts are spending even more, we can't keep up with a match of 50-50 necessarily. We can look at the fact that we are contributing more and more dollars every two years. This session, 80,000 new students to Texas uh, each year that we have to uh, accommodate I, for, and we put 2.65 billion more dollars into public ed. If that doesn't match a 50-50 comparison, yep. we may need to look at how many administrators are in each school. We may need to look at how expensive stadiums are at the local level. Spending doesn't always match what dollars go into the classroom and affect each child. So uh, as you know, Senator Creighton, the, one of the issues with reforming the school finance system this session was a concern on the part of the Senate and on the Lieutenant Governor's part, maybe first and foremost, that there be some sort of school choice component to any reform of public school finance. Mm -hmm. He in fact said a year ago to me in Houston, we're not gonna do one without the other, and indeed what happened, you didn't do one without the other. Do you, th this is three consecutive sessions in which Representative Oliverson's uh, body, the House, has pretty roundly uh, not come down on the side of school choice of the sort that the Senate has, uh, has advocated for. What do, you, what do we do about school choice? We have the opportunity now in the interim heading into another session to consider how we want to bring choice before elected officials and the voters of Texas. Where do you, where do you come down on this? Well, I, I think the school choice provisions that were passed out of the Senate specifically dealt with education savings accounts for special needs children and a few others in that uh, sort of eligibility or criteria uh, category. And so, yes, the Senate was disappointed that for real school finance solutions that I mentioned earlier, we got very close to passing, that those were derailed and rejected in the House because of that particular um, sort of funding request or policy change that right. would have been involved in that legislation. Put it another way, uh, some of those kids might need to leave the public schools with autism, for instance, and just learn coping mechanisms and certain things that those parents might find for those children in, in private schools that they offer specifically, and then they would go back to the public schools. So there started this, this huge media outcry that there is a war against public education in the Texas Senate, and that, 
could not be anything further. Well, you from understand the truth. that, Senator yeah. Creighton, the people you, you said the House rejected the opportunity to do school finance over school choice. Mm -hmm. The House could say the same thing over about the Senate, could it not? That the Senate was presented an opportunity to put a bunch more money into public education, but because the House would not take a school choice provision, the Senate ultimately decided not to do it. And you're right. I mean, on, on every major bill, it comes down to those negotiations. And so, for instance, the House put $1.8 billion into the public education bill that the right. Senate could only find in the math there was between three and five hundred million available and still be able to balance the state budget. Right, there was a fight over math. Correct. Right. So, so, yes, there's a policy decision to be made there, but the math is the math. Yep. And on uh, special needs options for uh, our, our children that uh, are challenged with autism and other special needs, to be able to have those opportunities, uh, Florida passed the same legislation, I think, 18 or 19 years ago. We saw in that period of time, over two decades, that less than 2% right. of the students even opted for those choices. And sometimes it was temporary and they went back to public schools. But uh, for some reason in the media, it was printed to project the outcome that public schools would crumble with those policy considerations. And I, I just don't understand why that was pitted that way. Representative Alverson, I appreciate Senator Creighton's perspective on this. The fact is the media didn't vote against school choice in the House. Republicans voted against it. My question is, why did school choice find such an unwelcome response in your body this session, third session in a row? Well, Evan, I can't necessarily speak to why um, you know, some of my colleagues would, would vote against this bill or that bill. I can tell you my perspective on school Please. choice. I, I, I'm a homeschool dad. We've homeschooled our kids for years now. Um, and so uh, I, I believe in school choice. Yep. I do, and I've, I've taken full advantage of it. Uh, I don't have an issue, as, as uh, Senator Creighton was talking about, I don't have an issue with providing uh, options for kids to, you know, particularly special needs kids who may have uh, very complex uh, learning disabilities and, and require a special approach to, to learning. I don't have a problem with uh, making that more available for them. Um, you know, my issue has always been, uh, in, in, in interesting from the homeschoolers' perspective, my issue has always been, you know, one of the reasons we went into homeschooling is because we wanted the government to leave us alone. We didn't want the government telling us how to educate our kids. Right. It wasn't in your case, Dr. Oliverson, it wasn't in your case that the quality of the schools, as we've said, in your community yeah. Were not, was not sufficient, Correct. right? I, I can tell you specifically that my oldest son has a fairly severe uh, attention deficit issues. Yep. His elementary school uh, that he was zoned to was an open concept school. And uh, I think, you know, my wife being an educator said that's, I mean, I'm not an educator, okay? Not but, gonna, but she said it's not, not going to work for him. It's not right. going to work for him. Yeah. Uh, so that was a decision that we made as a family. Um, one of the things, though, I think you opened the door to and concerns me, and I, and I can't really disagree with it uh, is that if you're going to take state money, then there has to be some accountability on the backside. And I wonder um, to what extent do we know or, or you know, so you, your, your public school system has this chain of accountability that the legislature has created. Right. You know, there's standardized testing, there's metrics, we have A through F, and we have all of these things. And so um, my concern, I guess, is just I, I, I wonder what accountability should we have, what accountability will we end up having? Right. In school choice in an environment like that. And, then, and quite frankly, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, that, in fact, Senator Creighton, has been the topic of conversation every time this has come up, is do the accountability measures that accompany tax dollars into the public school system follow those tax dollars when they go out of the public school system into other options? Now, for some people, they say not having those accountability measures is actually a positive thing because they can be innovative and disruptive mm -hmm. outside the public school system in a way that they're not currently allowed to be. But surely, as a good fiscal conservative, you understand that for some people, the idea that tax dollars would not have accountability attached to them is a kill card. Well, first, it's been stated a couple of times uh, today that Representative Oliverson has some of the best public schools in Texas. I would say that I have the best public schools in Texas. Okay, so, good. And I wanted to make that clear because I was... Uh, I don't want this to be another media problem, so I'm going to stay out of this fight, actually. That's and, fine, yeah. And the media is important because they affect the voters and they affect the mindset of the legislators when they vote. So those votes matter, but the media also affects them. All right. Well. So I want to make sure everyone stays relevant. Good. And, uh, the, Your schools are awesome. Made. Stipulated. Great. Right. Yeah. And our teachers. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. But what about the accountability question? So I think that uh, it, it's an important point that the dollars uh, are taxpayer dollars. Uh, and and, 
that same point uh, is what's driving the issue is parents can decide based on these accredited schools that the money you know is ultimately used within uh, th that accreditation uh, holds uh, a lot of validity uh, we can uh, certainly every two years judge the metrics and the feedback from how uh, those policies would work right but this isn't government money Th this money belongs to the parents that have contributed this money into the system and what they decide as far as the, d the outcomes for their special needs child under this policy I think should should uh, be paramount right I, I can just tell you as a, a again as a homeschool dad yes uh, my wife uh, who was the teacher I mean her thing was she didn't necessarily want a, a voucher or you know a savings account or anything like right. that what she wanted was just some acknowledgement from the state that you know these textbooks and this curriculum does cost money and just not to be taxed on those dollars or, or to get some kind of uh, credit that for the money that she did spend for right. the education in addition to the the taxes that we're already paying for the school district and yep. paying to the state and stuff like that and and so I mean, I think there's a lot of possibility there, are a lot of options yep. that we could do. You mentioned, Dr. Oliver, the property tax reform. This is something that in the legislature, as conservative as this one, with a near Republican supermajority in both the House and the Senate, you'd think property tax reform would be a layup. What happened? Why couldn't you get it done? You know, I just think that there was a fundamental disagreement about the way in which to get it done. I mean, I. The, um, so the, the, you know, the, the Senate proposal and the House proposal at the end of the day were very, very different. And unfortunately, there was not an ability to kind of come to the middle and sort of say, okay, you know, um, you know if it, it, and it, it sort of was interesting to me that it kind of boggled, it boiled down to how many, what percent of rollback are we going to agree to in some right. respects, right? Um, and so we start at eight and then we, you know, we, we say four, and then we say six, and, you know, five was thrown out, and, I mean, it, it just, the whole conversation broke down towards yep. the end of special session, and, and I just have to say, personally, and that, that kind of frustrated me, because I really wanted to get something done. This is the it complaint really, about government, is it not, uh, you know, not just here, but especially in Washington, that over what seems to be a relatively small difference, and as you say, it was about yeah, percentages, so, I mean, but ultimately it, nothing gets accomplished. Right, but again, I mean, it, it has to be meaningful, right? right? To just sort of put a window dressing yeah. on, on, you know, the issue is not really, uh, it's not substantive. And one of the things that I really want to focus on is, I, I mean, reforming the tax system is important, but I want to provide significant relief. Yeah. You know, um, I, I don't, I don't want to provide tax relief that, that is something where somebody looks at their bill at the end of the year that it's not a substantially they lower They can't see that there was even a, a, a even they a rebate. paid the year before. Right. Um, and that's not to say that controlling the rise of, uh, you know, local entities taxing, and I think the rollback is a great idea. I really do. And, um, but I think that we need, if, we, if what we want is to provide property tax relief, uh, we need to look for something that provides a bigger component right. of property. And that's why, you know, and I've talked about this before, and that's why the, the way we, the finance of schools, to me, as I thought about this issue in the special session, it really seemed to me like the two issues were, were intimately linked. Because right. at least from, from my household and, and my constituents, you know, 60% of their property tax bill is public education. Yep. And so to me, that's, that's a chunk of money that if we were to provide significant relief there, that's a chunk of money. And I, yep. again, I, I don't know I wasn't involved in any of those conversations or, you know, negotiations or whatever and, uh, at the end of special session. I, I just can say that I was frustrated that I didn't get to bring something home. You know, Senator Creighton, because you remember you were in the legislature at the time, the last round of property tax relief that was produced by the legislature that people campaigned on, look, we promised that we would do this and we did it. For a lot of taxpayers, the amount of money that we were talking about was not that significant, to Dr. Oliverson's point. What, what happened this time? It seems, again, like something that you all would have been able to find a point of agreement on, even if you didn't get everything you want and just arm in arm move down the road. What happened? A lot. <laughs> well, can you, can you boil it down? Can, I mean, you know, because for, for your constituents, the idea that this was the House and the Senate not being able to get on the same page is probably cold comfort. So there are about 40 counties in Texas that are fast track, high growth, either suburban or ur urban compounded growth counties. Yep. There's 254 counties in Texas. Right. 40 
out of 254. So outside of the 40 counties that are really growing fast, many rural counties are losing population. And nobody thinks of Texas in that way. Tax base shrinking, right. population diminishing. Nobody thinks of Texas in that regard. So the 40 counties that are desperate for property tax relief where property taxpayers are being suffocated at every turn. They live in the counties whose senators and representatives desperately want property tax relief and reform. Both of you mentioned the words relief and reform. Yeah, They're very different. Two sessions ago, we passed a property tax relief bill. That relief was an average of $216 per homeowner. Yeah. Two sessions ago, what happened when your appraisals came out and your tax bill hit just a few months later, that was not only washed out, you went backwards. You were a negative. Right so here. we, in the Senate, we care about reform. We cared about not 216 bucks that you would just be angry about once it finally was uh, computed and you figured out what was after the equal sign. We cared about true reform because as appraisals go up, and we can't get an appraisal cap passed because we need a two-thirds vote to change the Constitution. Again, 40 counties care. 254 counties represented total. So that's not going to happen. So we looked at our second best option, which is restraining the growth of revenue at the city and county level to match the mechanics that are already in place for school districts. Many, many people in the media were saying, why don't you fix school finance first? We don't have time just for property tax reform. We're actually working on both. But to actually accomplish it, and to hit reform, not just relief, because relief just kind of makes the, tr the people that are getting hurt the worst angry. Yep. Reform was restricting the amount of revenue coming into cities and counties, which we were seeing at 8, 10, 11, 12 percent new money a year. It's all being spent, yet all capital infrastructure and improvements are being bonded to the hilt to the extent that two Montgomery County road bonds have gone down in a row because people are just fed up Tired of debt. with the debt. Right. So we tried to get 4% uh, rollback in place, where simply if local government takes in more than 4% new money, the tax rates need to come down, or the voters speak and have to vote on whether or not local government can keep that extra revenue. That is fair. It's above growth and inflation. It's twice what the state budget spends. Yet there was a revolt among both parties that represent the mayors and the county judges that basically said, no matter what we're taking in and new money, stay out of our business. Well, but I thought the House, but Senator Creighton, to Representative Allerson's point, I thought the House simply ag agreed with you, but simply wanted that 4% to be a little bit higher. And it's simply 4% to 6%. The math showed there was no change. So, so half a loaf would not have been better in this case than no loaf? Half a loaf would have been incredible, but from 4%, to the house is 6%, there would be no change. If you think I can come home and go door to door in Senate District 4 and explain that we champion property tax, not relief, because that never happens, reform at that, on that doorstep with that family, John and Mary Smith, and say, I got it done for you. And at 6%, if we would have negotiated and agreed with the house on that, it meant nothing. Right. They'd slam the door in my face. So who's, whose fault, Senator Creighton, was it that this didn't get done? Well, the fault is, in my opinion, the, the Senate passed 4% property tax relief five times, and the House rejected it. So agreeing with the policy that we drafted and promoted. It's on the House. The House. I don't mean to point to you, Dr. Ross. And, and the, vote, the, the House members vote. I mean, there were many House members that supported the effort. Right. But depending on their districts, they may feel right. like there's different math, there's different priorities. Yeah. It's all about... Well, how do you get consensus? Well, and you mentioned actually that it was mayors and you had local officials in various places who pushed back on this. Right. To, to slightly pivot this conversation for the two of you, this was really a session in which the relationship between the municipalities and the state was the narrative through line on almost every issue. Correct. And right? I mean, the instance, tension between local control on the one hand and as Senator Huffines, your colleague, calls it, local liberty on the other hand. Right. Talk about that as an important part of this last year. Well, and I, and I want to make it clear, look, Representative Oliverson, many state representatives in the House uh, had votes that supported reform in the Senate plan. But if you can't 
get a majority of the votes passed. Again, the appraisal cap needed two-thirds of the House. Property tax reform, as the Senate promoted, it needed 76 votes. Simple, a majority. simple majority. Right, and again, right. the reason that it didn't pass was not because Democrats banded together to oppose it necessarily, but there were enough Republicans who also opposed it as well. Correct. And then, what was your question? Well, my question was about whether the people who voted against it were doing that on the basis of what they heard locally. You know that their local officials were pressuring them to oppose what the Senate had. You alluded to this, and right? The yeah. Texas Association of Counties and the Texas Municipal League were adamant against the legislation. And I, I think as a, as a former House member, I know what it's like to be on a two-year term to come home uh, hot off of a session, especially extended sessions and specials, right. and to be able to have to answer to local leaders that are upset yeah. in that regard. Uh, but I thought you were speaking more of the hypocrisy of being pro-Tenth Amendment and say, Fed, stay out of our business. Oh, no, I didn't, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't bring up hypocrisy at all. I was simply asking. Good. Yeah. I mean, I can get, <laughs> I'll go there if you want. We have time. I'd love to talk about uh, it. We can. Yeah. But I was really asking yeah. more about the question of the degree to which local officials and local, maybe I'll ask Dr. Oliver to this, you know, we had a lot of fights this session over local yeah. control, over yeah. the degree to which mayors and council members, county commissioners, were properly in control of various issues. And really, the state came down pretty heavily on the side of, of not giving those local officials the say that they may have traditionally thought they should have or, or, or did have. Right. The property tax issue was resolved to some degree as a local control issue as well, was it not? That local officials put pressure on members of both parties to vote the way that they did. I mean, I'm sure that's definitely a way you could look at it. Yeah. To, yeah. to your point, though, with regards to the local control, I, I, it's, it's all right with you. I'd like to, to spend some time. I wish you would, please. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I grew up in Kingwood. And so if there's a community in Texas that's been a rallying cry, I mean, what, you talked about things that we got done that, that meant a lot, not just for the folks back home, but personally to, right. to the members. Being able to get some reasonable annexation reform legislation passed uh, was a huge, huge in my mind. I mean, right. right. That and was really, another big, I mean, another big hairy issue this session, was it not? I can't yeah, tell you how yeah. frustrated and, uh, and upset I was. Um, and, and we had actually moved out of Kingwood at the time. I was in medical school when yep. Kingwood was annexed. But I lived there from 1977 to graduating high school in 90. We always lived under the fear that Houston was coming to get us. Yep. And you know what? They did come get us. And when they came and got us, they didn't provide services uh, that they were supposed to. And, uh, you know, crime went up and EMS response times went up. And uh, I, I think being able to have a vote to say, um, you know, as the wood uh, Woodlands here with the township has been able to, to choose a path towards self-government. Yep. I think an unincorporated community has a right to be able to, to choose its own destiny. You know, yep. People have an option of whether they want to live in the city or not. That's the kind that's, of local control you like. That's the kind of, well, you know, it is, it is. Now, I, I do think that, you know, sometimes local control is one of those issues where you, you scratch your head and you say, is this really constitutional? Is this really an issue? And um, you haven't brought it up yet, but I assume we were gonna talk about it, so I'll just segue into the whole Privacy Act issue. You know, I personally think that, um, local municipalities creating their own uh, protected classes that are not currently enshrined in the Constitution is, is uh, unconstitutional local control. And I don't want to see school districts, I don't want to see cities, I don't want to see communities uh, basically, you know, saying this is a protected class here and then, you know, uh, somewhere else it's not. So you, you have a situation where a child um, is able to participate on the girls volleyball team and in the school district in which they reside and then they go to another school district and that's they don't have that same policy and I don't want to see all these different policies there are some things that ought to be uniform across right. the state because uh, you know some things are better uh, civil rights in particular those are things that should be decided at the state or federal level we so, shouldn't so have a patchwork quilt well and that, that's where I was headed so this is the pa it's a patchwork of inconsistent laws or regulations that's how you see this issue this oh, was what was tremendous. said at the time that the uber and lyft issue came up and became a big topic of conversation during the session it was said we need to standardize the regulations around this so that we don't have an inconsistent patchwork same as you feel on this other issue I, I do I think per, I think these issues you know I mean there are probably some 
issues like that, local control issues that could probably be left to the communities to figure out. But when it when it's talking about rights, liberties, you know, right. things like that, I mean, we need we need consistent policy across the state. I I shouldn't have different regulations governing ride sharing in one community than I do in another community, right. which right. you know, especially for traveling and stuff like that. I, I just I didn't I, I didn't understand why that would even why we would want that unless of course the reason for that is because we don't want them there at all. Right. Now you understand Senator Crate, without looking above us to the federal government, which we've talked about many times, you allude to. This is where people say, but the conservative elected officials of the state used to talk about local control in terms of the state staying out of a lot of this stuff, and it now seems as if the two sides have shifted perspective. Can you reflect on that or talk about that? There, there are always uh, concerns and uh, the need to adjust policies at the state level. I mean, we, we represent, uh, Dr. Oliverson and I re represent the same constituents that these mayors, councilmen, commissioners, county judges represent. Right. And they ask us for the help to step in uh, with certain concerns that, quite frankly, the local control is driven by the people that, uh, you know, are in control, and that is the everyday citizen. That's voters. That's correct, yeah. and, and that's the way it should be. So as we work on appraisal uh, policies or as we work on school finance or as we work on uh, certain things that uh, deal with um, pensions or a city's ETJ and what powers they have in the right. ETJ to annex uh, with, with, with the certain neighborhoods or, or homeowners that don't have a vote on that city council or a say. These are all things that, uh, that our shared constituents are asking us for. The state created the federal government, the state created cities and counties and uh, school districts. and the state, the state is sovereign up and down. Sometimes we right. have to um, act based on those requests. We've had a lot of discussions about the 10th Amendment. I'm, I'm certainly one that wants the federal government to stay out of the of business of the state of Texas. You were 10th Amendment before 10th yeah. Amendment was cool. Let's Thank acknowledge you. that. Well, That's I appreciate right. that. Yeah. yeah. Very much. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, the, you know, there's very few uh, powers that the, that the feds should be working on. All else is left to the states. But in our state constitution, there's not a 10th Amendment for the cities and counties. The state, the state is responsible. The state is sovereign for these issues and right. local control is wonderful as long as our citizens are pleased at the local level if they ask their uh, elected representatives to assist then we can either say no or we can or say, say yes. yes so on this question that i did not bring up the the bathroom bill uh although right, dr so. oliverson uh, did uh that was another item that again in a conservative legislature with nearly two-thirds of the House and Senate, each Republican, and a governor who indicated later in the session than earlier, but eventually that he would sign such legislation. Um, how come that didn't get done? Well, I want to make it clear for the audience and those listening and watching that in 141 days of coverage on the bathroom bill, we were working on many, many other priorities. Okay, <laughs> so the coverage on that legislation made it seem like that was our main priority and only our priority and everything else was set aside couldn't have been further from the truth but if you're concerned about then president obama sending a letter to every one of our texas school districts saying your title nine funding for girls athletics and ex extracurricular activities and all the other things that's wonderful that it supports is going away forever if you don't take the gender-specific signage down off of your restrooms, changing facilities, showers, and locker rooms. We cared about that. I don't know how many others care about that, but we were hearing across Texas that that is a very, very not letting Texas run Texas specific aggressive stance from the federal level, and we took action on it because we didn't want our school districts in Texas liable from very clever attorneys that would be aggressive based on those policies, and so it's important. Well, I, I didn't ask why, I mean, yeah. I got it. I understand why <laughs> it's important, but I asked you how come it didn't pass. It didn't pass because there was a lot of, um, of misinformation on, on need, priority, and, you know, just uh, outright negotiations that came down to the wire where we couldn't agree on language. Yeah. I, and, I, 
I would add to that, that it, you know, uh, obviously the Trump administration has rescinded. Well, in fact, fairly early in the session, they said we're going to pull the Obama did, directive. But back. they also did. said in the letter that they laid out that states should provide statewide consistent guidance on right. this issue. And, and other states have done that, and they've gone in different directions on the issue. But the fact of the matter is, is that Texas needs to have consistent statewide guidance on this particular issue. This is not right. something that should be left up to the school board. And if the business community, as it did during the special session, comes back to you and says, we're concerned that this legislation will somehow impede economic competitiveness and the business climate, Dr. Oliverson, your response is what? I, I uh, quite frankly don't see how that could be the case. I don't. I, I, I scratch my head. but. You know, the reality is, is that uh, if Jeff Bezos or anyone else, you know, wants to basically hold uh, us all hostage and say, well, we're not moving here unless you change, you know, your social policy to fit our needs, then quite frankly, I don't want his business. You'd rather not have, do you agree I with, say, yeah, yeah I, I would like you to, yeah, do you, I want to ask, in the, this context, Lieutenant Governor Patrick said over the weekend that he didn't understand the point of the Committee on Economic Competitiveness that Speaker Strauss has appointed which is being perceived as a blocking back for further pushback against this bathroom legislation. Do you agree that a conversation around economic competitiveness on this issue is a non-starter? Well, we're, we're the leader of economic competitiveness in the nation, and we have been for years and years. Even during the big recession, we created, Texas created over half the nation's private sector jobs during that really rough period. And Correct. even with oil down, we stack up pretty well. Continuing to study that, I think the recipe was launched by Governor, then Governor Perry, now Energy, Energy Secretary Perry, that uh, a balanced budget, low taxes, regulatory reform, tort reform, yep. all of these issues keep us at the forefront of uh, the nation's economic climate. Continuing to study that, um, you know, as a former House member, I don't, I don't get into their business on what they decide through a select committee to study that, just like the Senate launches uh, you know, different efforts to study during the interim. That's what this year and a half leading up to the new session you have no, you have no beef. You have no beef with that. I don't, but, but the, I the, don't the, see the economic impact as North Carolina showed that if we lose a March Madness tournament with a $1 trillion GDP to keep people safe in right. multi-shower locker rooms and changing room facilities on school district campuses, I would let March Madness go to Kentucky. I mean, I just I keep, have keep no problem people say. Got yeah. Okay, we have about ten about ten minutes for questions from the audience. Qu quickly, the Harvey impact. This is obviously a significant issue for the 22 percent of the state that's impacted, and this area is definitely part of the uh, of the region impacted. Uh, probably impacted less than uh, le less than a lot of other places, but nonetheless, it's still a present issue on the minds of people here. Dr. Oliverson, are you concerned about the economic impact of the Harvey rebuild on the state budget heading into the next cycle? I am, Evan. I, I am concerned, and, and uh, I think we're, we're really only realizing sort of the tip of the iceberg as far as that's concerned. I, I had heard that the, the FEMA dollars that uh, we've you know, been told we're, we're going to get, uh, homeowners, business owners, things right. like that, it may take up to two years. For well, there's a, there are funds. a bunch of concerns about how quickly the money is and, coming. And so I, I wonder, you know, uh, are we able to, are, are these business owners able to shoulder that burden in the meantime? And I think yep. we need to be creative, and I think we need to look for solutions. Texas has got a history of solving Texas's problems. You right. know? And so I think we need to step up again uh, and figure that out. I think we have uh, infrastructure problems. I think that there's going to be a need to sit down and have some serious conversations about what role does Texas play in, a, in the next budget cycle in terms of uh, do, are there capital improvement projects that simply can't wait for the Army Corps of Engineers to make up their mind as to whether or not. Right. I know my constituents in, in the Cypress Creek uh, watershed, um, we sure would like to get that third reservoir that we were promised in the 1940s built. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know that we can necessarily wait for the federal government to prioritize that. It's apparently not a big priority. Uh, but we need it. You know, yeah. we need uh, we need major infrastructure. And I, I guess if I could segue a little bit on, on one issue uh, related to that is just that I, I am also very concerned that the way in which we go about informing the public about the risk of potential flooding is not useful information. We talk about hundred-year floodplains and five hundred-year floodplains and this, that, and the other thing. And the reality is that. I don't dispute that they calculate the numbers the way they're supposed to, 
but I dispute whether or not a homeowner who's supposedly in a 500-year floodplain and is trying to make a decision about whether they need flood insurance is getting useful information to help them accurately assess what their risk is year to year. And I really think, I don't know that that's something necessarily that we can do without the federal government, without FEMA's involvement, but it concerns me when I hear constituent after constituent say, you know, um, this is the, I live in the 500 year floodplain and my house has flooded three times in the last five years. How is that a 500 year floodplain? Yeah. And I can understand that they have all kinds of, of arguments as to say, well, you know, statistics and risk and stuff like that. But I think what my constituents are telling me is that they're not able to accurately assess their risk. Yeah. And we need yeah. to do a better job. Uh, Senator Crane, let me let you in here on Harvey before we get to questions quickly. Please. What do you think about the Harvey impact on the state budget and what should we be doing to prepare for it in the next two years? Uh, you, you know, we passed a very lean budget. We were uh, really not expecting uh, the Medicaid expenses that were involved when we came in last time around. As we mentioned, oil remains and has been low, and that's a big part of our revenue feed. I think the answer is it's early. Uh, we're still getting the numbers. We're still seeing the federal right. dollars roll in. And it's either way, it's going to be expensive. And I think the comptroller came in as, at an estimate of around $2 billion. It could grow from there. Yeah, in, in fact, it's almost certainly once we get into the yeah. guts of this, going to get more expensive and not less. Uh, if you have questions that you want to ask, feel free to jump up at the microphone and on either side, and we're happy to, My favorite part. to have you get in. It's just your favorite part? It is. Yeah. I like town hall. Well, they'll ask better questions than I will, I'm sure. Uh, sir, well, we have a microphone, but go ahead. Use your outside voice. We're happy to have your question. Go ahead. Yes. And uh, talk about passing control down to the you talk about passing control down to the local level. Yes. Uh, that extends to these property owners associations. And uh, I am in a situation now where, according to state law, I was uh, supposed to be able to ask my property owners association to review their books and records. And all these books and records are itemized in their articles of incorporation as Exhibit A. Yes. In my particular case. Well, it seemed like a simple case of going before the Justice of the Peace and uh, filing a petition asking for a judgment to allow me to look at the books and records. Uh, that cost me $46 to file that petition. I was trying to protect my fellow property owners who had requested the same information. What, what's your question, sir? It wound up costing me, here's $7,000 to file an appeal against the judgment that I received. Right. A judgment saying, I did it wrong. Okay? And now I have to hire an attorney, and he's requiring another $10,000 retainer right. to represent me in the appeal. So what's your question? My question is, when are you going to do something to redo the disaster that is the Texas property code as it affects property owners associations. Senator Creighton, this is not the first time you've heard a story like this. It's an unfortunate story, but it's one that's we, we've heard year in and year out, right? First, I want to say we have private security here on campus. If you're carrying seven grand on you, you might want to ask them to walk you to your car. But no, it's, a, it's an honest, great crowd. Yeah, got it, got it. He's packing, so he's good. He's good. Uh, on, prop, on property owners associations, uh, those are private contracts, and we always have a bill during the legislative session to overhaul or sort of retrade the promises made between parties and property owners associations. But uh, time and time again, the bill continues to fail because we have a problem in the legislature retroactively breaking a contract when you've signed. With, along with your deed and your closing documents, those, those property owners association covenants. And so the, the route you're going, although it's expensive, is probably the way that it's going to have to be uh, to make them divulge the information they're liable for. You can understand the frustration of somebody like Absolutely. this gentleman here at the, yeah. and the expense. Yes. Yes, it's a very frustrating situation, uh, and, and that, that bill is, has gotten close to, to being passed but still a couple of different it. sessions. Senator Royce West out of Dallas uh, keeps filing it, but we've just uh, not had the votes to, to get it done because we keep 
right. uh, failing to gather the, the overall for consensus that bill? for it. Are you for it? Uh, I didn't vote in, uh, for it in the draft that, that was proposed because uh, it didn't solve the problems you mentioned. Okay. Ma'am. Um, well, you hit on a little bit about um, Hurricane Harvey, but I'm just curious as to when the next budget comes up, Yes. which and how many of or across the board will these programs be cut or slimmed down any leaner than they already are? And Which yes, pro programs of what kind? Any program in the state budget that has to be cut to balance the budget because of right. hurricane relief. That and where, this is just a, a curious question as to where do monies go for, from uh, revenue received from, say, last year the Super Bowl and this year the World Series? Where does that money go to? Does it stay in the city of Houston alone or do other programs benefit from the monies that are, are, are brought into the city. Dr. Robertson, did, uh, in the first part of the question, are things going to have to be cut heading into the next session? Do you believe that the state can take care of its responsibility on Harvey relief, its percentage, entirely by backfilling with the rainy day fund, or is it going to require cuts in agency budgets? I think it's probably too early to tell. I think we have to leave all options on the table for right now, because one of the things that we don't really know is, is what effect, per se, is this going to have on the economy and what uh, what are we going to actually bring in? You know, what, what we decide to cut or not cut is most likely a function of how much revenue the comptroller tells us we have available to spend. Um, if the property think, tax base or tax collections go down, that would have an impact. Well, it, it certainly would, from, and especially from a school finance perspective, I think it would have a, a big, I mean, I think you, you could see uh, and that the state could end up paying a higher percentage, uh, you know, uh, by default in some of these school districts than it has traditionally, just because the revenues from property tax goes down so substantially right. in some of these affected areas. Um, it, but it may even, and I'm sure it will, trickle into the sales tax and, and other things that we use at the state level to, to make sure those coffers are, are filled. I, I will point out, when you talk about cutting programs and stuff like that, so much of the revenue that we have uh, available to spend, we don't really have available to spend because it's dedicated revenue. Well, in I'm, fact, and Mike, you can what, correct Mike. me if I'm wrong on this, but I think it's only about 15% of our budget is actually stuff where we can move from one bucket to the other or we can cut here and, and put it there. So much of it is non-discretionary spending. You know, we're obligated constitutionally to pay for public education and people are in the Medicaid program are gonna get care uh, ongoing, you know, one of the things we do when we come back every session is we we pay for the health care expenses that have already been spent, and we haven't, you know, we appropriated the money for it. So um, there's not a, a whole lot, and then of course there's money dedicated for transportation as well. So there's not a whole lot that we can move around in order to make those accommodations. I think what my question is, though, which programs are going to suffer? Well, I think he's saying we don't know yet. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any way of knowing that right now. It's, it's early. We're still trying to get to the I, bottom of it. I can tell you yeah. that we will, and I, I think I can speak for my colleague, we, we will do our absolute best to make sure where, wherever we get that money that it's something that doesn't cut a, cut a program or something that, that's necessary, right? We're always looking for waste to trim here, um, but we don't want to see uh, programs that are working properly, that are vital, be unfunded. Sir. Yes, sir. Good to see you, Mr. Craig. Uh, could, I, could you speak on this? Uh, a few months ago, uh, President Trump formed this uh, Boulder Integrity Commission, and a lot of states sued because they wanted the uh, Social Security numbers, the addresses, and voting history. Right. Recently, Texas, I think a couple weeks ago, decided to send that information up, and one of the biggest concerns was that that information is available to any foreign government or anybody who wants it. But the concern is battered women. If that information falls into the hands of, you know, anyone, they know all the battered women are yet. And also uh, our military. We have guys with top secret clearance. And if that information falls into the wrong hand, it could be right. detrimental to our national security. Could you speak well, on that? My understanding is that the information requested by the Voter Fraud Commission that the president established was that we were only going to send the public in, the information that was already on the public voter file. Is that That's right? right? That's already out there. So it's not information of the sort that would potentially fall into the wrong well, hands. I, I just happened to be at a seminar with some of the largest that actually was 
filed the lawsuit. Right. And their concern was bad the women. Right. Well, let me ask, let me ask Senator Creighton on the general topic of this commission. You believe we have a voter fraud problem in the state of Texas? I, I think it's been clear, really, from a bipartisan standpoint, on request through the legislature uh, that voter ID, passing voter ID, has been a priority, and and a high percentage of Texas has supported that concept of simply showing identification when you go to uh, make your say in an election. And yes, I think that there have been examples across the state of voter fraud, and it doesn't matter if there are hundreds of those examples or one, right. we need integrity in our elections process. Dr. Alverson, the pushback, of course, is that the kind of voter protection or voter suppression, depending upon which side you're on, that's how it would be framed. Measures ultimately in, uh, create uh, uh, an opportunity for discrimination against some voters. What do you say about that? If we're talking about voter ID, I have to concur with my colleague. I, I think that um, you know the majority of even even for uh, uh, citizens who are, are are very unfortunate economic circumstances, there are many things that you have to have an ID in order to be able to do. And I, I do find it troubling that um, we seem to think that voting is sort of the one thing that you shouldn't have to have identification for. When you you got to have an ID to open a bank account. You got to have ID to take out a mortgage. You got to have ID to cash a check. Uh, you got to prove identification when you go to get, uh, you know, uh, government assistance and things like that. I mean, I, to me, it seems pretty straightforward. I've never really understood the voter suppression aspect of, of voter ID, especially in view of the fact that I think the legislature has made great steps, has listened to, you know, cost of getting ID, and has has taken great pains to make sure that. People who do find themselves in vulnerable economic circumstances are still able to meet that requirement. The legislation passed this session, which expanded the number of, of available identification forms. Right. For right. Well, and in, in the cost, you know, and the cost. To, to deal with the cost issue and make it so that it's not a it, burden. It's not a burden on on the voter. And you're not concerned from the questioner standpoint about information going up to the federal government well, endangering the privacy of people in this state. Let me just say this about that, and I think we should always be concerned, especially in a day and age where, you know, it's not just in the country, but there are foreign entities yes. that are, you know, uh, hacking our data. I know I was involved in one of these credit breaches recently yes. and such. And, but I do think at the end of the day, voter ID is one of those things, I mean, I'm sorry, voter fraud is one of those things where we know it's out there. Um, we debate uh, uh, very vociferously about how big of a problem it is and where it's located. Look, we're only as good as the data is accurate. Yep. And so I think in some, in some respects, we have to uh, make it possible to collect accurate and reliable data so that we can say for, for a fact there's voter fraud and it's right here. And, and there's no voter fraud over here. And so we know where to go and where it's located and then we can actually deal with it. Sir. Good morning. Uh, it seemed that the choice legislation from your uh, uh, discussion came down limited to special needs children. This is on school choice. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Wouldn't parents who deal with those needs daily have a better sense of their child's needs? And is resistance more about uh, if we give this, the nose of the camel is in the tent rather than a better solution? So the question is, would the, the pilot program that the Senate advocated for on special needs children as related to school choice be the camel's nose under the tent that might open the door to full-blown vouchers? That's at least the last half of the question. Uh, the, that exact question and um, th those concerns, I, I think at the end of the day, were exactly what was driving the negotiation outcomes on both sides is in, the, I know, from talking to members of the Senate Republican Caucus, uh, many that supported the education savings accounts for special needs children did not feel that was the end all for public schools or the opening of the door for, for, for uh, wide scale vouchers for every child. But th there seemed to be a lot of sentiment along those lines that to give an inch is to give a mile and our special needs kids uh, drew the, you, you know, unfortunately, were the ones that didn't benefit at the end of the day on those decisions. So we passed it a few different times in that version. The House, uh, you know, chose not to adopt those policies, and that's where we left off. Time, I'm, Agnes, tell me I have time for one more. I'm sorry. Sir. 
Senator Crichton, my question uh, was is along the lines of clarification for something you said before. Earlier when discussing public and private schools, you suggested that a child with autism or special needs should be sent to a private school to learn coping skills before being transferred back to public schools. I found this somewhat troubling and pretty representative of your party's views on public education. Is it your position that children with special needs should not be the responsibility of the public education system? I, I think it's a great question, and, and the only problem with the question is should was could. So I, I didn't say that special needs children should go into the private schools to learn coping skills. I said that as, as parents of special needs children have told me in, in my capital office time and time again, that if they wanted to opt to be able to do that, they might continue to use the public schools on down the road once they receive the benefit of what some of the private school options may offer. And so those requests are overwhelming to consider those policies. And the, the point made is that there is there's not, in a lot of these families' minds, that for their requests and preferences, it's not a public schools are terrible and private schools are better, so give me my money. It is that as a parent, I'd like to direct these education outcomes because both are great but I'm not receiving exactly what my child needs right now. In a couple of years, I may, and so please give me that option. But thank you very much for your question. Good. I'm sorry that we're out of time. We promised to have, have you out of here at 1 o'clock, and we're pretty close to 1 o'clock right now. Good of Senator Creighton and Representative Oliverson to be with us. Thanks to them. Thanks to Lone Star College. And thanks to all of you for being here. We'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator always always great to appreciate you.